Hello and welcome to the webinar on managing business disruptions under uncertain TV simulation. My name is Arash Madavi and I'm your host today. Due to the ongoing pandemic, we could not properly set up a live session from our office. So the entire webinar is pre-recorded. However, my colleagues and I are online and ready to answer your questions live via the GoToWebinar question box. Okay, let's start the webinar. Managing under uncertainty is not easy, especially when you are facing new realities that have never been experienced before. There is no relevant historical data for proper forecasting, which makes even the most analytically sophisticated organization prone to unmitigated risks. However, there is a solution that at its core has been built upon causality and systems intrinsic rules. That approach is simulation which allows you to explore uncharted territories and forecast for novel scenarios like large-scale disruptions due to pandemics. In this webinar, we will review the basic ideas behind simulation modeling and how it could be used for forecasting and decision-making under uncertainty. We will review example models and case studies in domains such as customer management, manufacturing, warehousing, retail, supply chain, and healthcare. We will also demonstrate how you can deploy, share, and run your simulation models and experiment in the cloud. At the end, we'll cover the intersection of simulation modeling and artificial intelligence with an emphasis on testing the efficacy of AI solutions inside simulated environments. A model is a representation of how something works. There are many different ways to represent how something works. For example, a mental model is your understanding of how things work in the real world. Excel sheets, in addition to mathematical, machine learning, and even physical models, are other ways of representing something. And of course, simulation models, which provide us with a flexible virtual world where we can easily create anything imaginable. First. Let's review why we use models. In many cases, we cannot afford finding the right solutions by experimenting with real objects. Building, destroying, or making changes in the real world may be too expensive, dangerous, or just impossible. Therefore, instead of experimenting in the real world, we enter the world of models. In this risk-free environment, we can test the system's behavior under various conditions, compare different scenarios, or even explore an optimum configuration. When we find the solution we are looking for, we can map that solution back to the real world. In a nutshell, the reason that we use models is to take advantage of experimenting in a risk-free environment. Before we continue with a more comprehensive review of modeling, and especially simulation modeling, let's lay the groundwork by reviewing two important concepts that are fundamental for understanding the usefulness of simulation modeling, uncertainty and causal inference. Let's start with uncertainty. Many important problems involve decision-making under uncertainty, that is, choosing actions based on often imperfect observations, with unknown outcomes, but uncertainty itself can have different levels. Let's dive a little bit deeper into different levels of uncertainty that I borrowed from an Harvard Business Review article. Level 1. A clear enough future. At level 1 of uncertainty, the environment is so controlled that a single simple forecast of the future could be precise enough for strategy development. Level 2. Alternate Futures At level 2, the future can be described as one of a few alternate outcomes or discrete scenarios. Level 3. A range of futures At level 3, a range of potential futures can be identified. That range is defined by a limited number of key variables, but the actual outcome may lie anywhere along a continuum bounded by that range. Level 4. True Ambiguity at level 4, multiple dimensions of uncertainty interact to create an environment that is virtually impossible to predict. Level 4 situations are quite rare and they tend to migrate toward one of the other levels over time. In general, forecasting in level 1 should be simple and data-centric solutions may be sufficient unless the system has a nonlinear or dynamic nature. 
At level 4, we are dealing with so much ambiguity that we may need to make drastic assumptions or just take actions based on the best educated guess. However, the majority of real scenarios fall under level 2 and 3. Simulation models can help us to very effectively forecast possible futures under levels 1, 2, or 3. Let's now look at the task of modeling from a different perspective. As mentioned, a model is a representation of how something works. Simulation models are built based on causal relationships in a system and therefore we need to better understand causal inference. Perl describes the three levels of causal inference in his ladder of causation that I borrowed from his popular book, The Book of Why. Wrong 1. Association this wrong deals with identifying regularities in past behavior. It seeks to identify and codify patterns, relationships, and associations based upon past behaviors or data in order to predict future behaviors. This wrong calls for prediction based on passive observations. Humans, some animals, and computers are capable of this level of inference. Current learning machines, including deep learning algorithms, are still limited to this wrong. From a business perspective, all the data analytics, including a state of the practice machine learning techniques, can reach wrong one inference at most. Wrong two, intervention. Wrong two builds on the previous wrong by asking what might happen based on possible interventions or different scenarios. We cannot answer questions about interventions with passively collected data, as it requires a larger scope than a data point. The data needed for this kind of inference should be collected carefully in a controlled environment. One example of this inference level is A-B testing, also known as bucket testing or split run testing, which is a common user experience research methodology. Another good example is randomized trials for approving the efficacy and safety of new drugs. Wrong 3. Imagining. Wrong 3 requires the understanding of causal relationships for situations that are completely imaginary, an ability that only humans currently have the capacity of. The goal is to be able to reason about hypothetical situations. In these scenarios, we do not have access to past data. We cannot even collect control data, either because the imaginary scenario had happened in the past or because there would be no practical way to set up a real-world experiment to gather the controlled data. To be clear, Mr. Pearl's definition is only applicable to counterfactuals and not to imaginary future scenarios, but for practical reasons, I extended it in the context of our topic. A good relevant example of this kind of scenarios is when we want to understand how the business will perform with the COVID-19 pandemic. The situations and conditions of relevance have not been experienced before, and there is not relevant past data that is uniquely similar to what we are experiencing now. As you can see, humans still have a dominant superiority in causal inference, with machines being limited to wrong one. Despite that, machines have far more raw computational power compared to humans. Now we can put these thoughts together to arrive at the notion that simulation modeling lets us combine the unique causal inference capabilities of human brain with the superhuman computational powers of computers. Together, possible futures can be predicted under different levels of uncertainties in a manner that is not possible with any other quantitative approach. What is dynamic simulation? If you are completely new to simulation models, they are very similar to computer games. The model shows how the simulated system moves through time a possible future. In case the model is stochastic, it may show a range of futures. Outputs are observed as time moves, everything is visible, accessible, and measurable, and if something happens, you always know why. To simplify the role of simulation modeling in a business sense, we can say that simulation is a forecasting tool that is used for decision making under uncertainty. 
Simulation is used to see the impact of business decisions before implementing them. Compared to other tools, for example, spreadsheet-based solutions, simulation handles time and causal dependencies. Therefore, it always explains why things happen. Simulation is the only way to predict under uncertainty and thus reduce risk. Simulation is also visual. You can use it to communicate and convince stakeholders, especially in cases when the proposed solution is complex and hard to communicate. I think we have gone over enough theory and conceptual ideas behind simulation modeling, and now it's time to dive into some models. But first, let's briefly take a look at AnyLogic's development environment. As you can see, we have an extensive number of palettes that basically contain all the elements that the modeler can put together to build a model. They include a wide range of model building tools, ranging from a specialized block to building conveyor systems, moving transporters, and controlling traffic, rail, and pedestrians. There are also tool sets like graphs, database connectivity tools, and elements for designing interactive user interfaces. Let's start by looking at a simulation model called consumer credit. This is a simulation of the consumer credit approval process in a bank. The client can apply at the credit office or submit an online application on the bank's website. It also takes into consideration whether the client already has an existing internet bank account with increased verification required for new customers. Verification of the application takes place in three stages, scoring, personal review, and credit rating inspection. The model describes all stages of an application's life cycle, including the result of all revisions needing to take place. This can be used to find the optimal number of bank employees. This type of process-centric operation is really prevalent in businesses that need to manage their customer processing. For a current example, local governments in the US are dealing with an unexpected surge in applicants for unemployment benefits as the result of COVID-19 pandemic. To keep up, many additional resources are needed to process the application, but the exact amount needed is difficult to determine. Past data won't help us in determining on applications processing time because we've never have encountered something even close to this search. However, a simulation model can easily simulate this novel case since the rules of the process are unchanged. From this fact, the model could tell us the expected processing time. So far so good. We can see that the model can simulate novel scenarios. But running a simulation only predicts what happens based on the preset input data. For example, although the influx of applicants is out of our hand, the number of bank employees is something that we can manage by adding or reallocating resources. In this model, if we simulate one day of operation with six bank clerks, their daily utilization would be something around 20%. However, this prediction does not tell us what the desired number of clerks would be if we want to keep the processing time under a specific threshold. I think now it's a good time to take a look at experiments that we can build on top of our models. So far, we have only talked about simulation experiments. AnyLogic has a comprehensive list of experiments that let you use simulation modeling as a prescriptive medium by exploring possible futures. Simulation experiment run the model with animation displayed. Sensitivity analysis experiment runs the model multiple times varying one of the parameters and shows how the simulation output depends on it. Parameters variation experiment performs several single model runs varying one or more parameters. Using this experiment, you can compare the behavior of model with different parameter values. Compare runs experiment is similar to parameter variation experiment, except that instead of the input values automatically changing in a predefined range, the user can interactively control the inputs.
Monte Carlo experiment obtains and displays a collection of simulation outputs for a stochastic model or for a model with stochastically varied inputs that are sampled from known distributions. Optimization experiment finds the optimal combination of input values that results in the best possible solution. Calibration is a specialized form of optimization that tries to find the input values that result in the best fit between the simulation output and real data. Custom experiment is a fully customized scenario programmed by the user. Going back to our consumer credit model, you can see here that we have an optimization experiment. Running it lets us find the optimal number of bank employees for minimizing the average amount of time needed to process applications. You can see that with this number of bank employees, we can process applications in the minimum possible time. If you are interested to see more about the real application of simulation-based optimization, you can read more in the case study Optimizing Trading Business Process with AnyLogic. In this case study, you will see how Fannie Mae, which is a U.S. government-sponsored enterprise that operates in the secondary mortgage market, tested and validated some of their new processes. With the help of simulation-based analysis, they calculated the optimum number of analysts required to accomplish our required task. They also evaluated business resiliency strategies by running sensitivity experiments to identify potential bottlenecks. Now let's take a look at the model of a concrete factory. This model depicts the process of concrete production step by step from raw material to pallets of concrete blocks. The major stages of concrete production process include mixed preparation, mold pouring, rising, cutting, separation, autoclaving, and unboxing. The overall productive capacity depends on the properties of the factory. The model is designed in a way that we can initialize it with different configurations. For example, we can set the number and size of autoclaves in addition to choosing the separation type. The idea of this model is to get the full information about process timing to find the best way to increase factory performance. As you can see, this model is pretty detailed and has the elaborate 3D animation that lets us visualize the operation. Aside from helping the modeler to verify and validate their model, having such a clear animation helps communicate different scenarios to all the stakeholders. Basically, nothing can beat a good visualization in conveying a large amount of information in a concise way. Under the Statistics tab, we can see a variety of live outputs, such as a detailed log of the ongoing process, utilization of each resource, and daily output. You might think to yourself that such an elaborate and detailed model is not an easy undertaking, but you should consider the fact that the usefulness of a model is not directly correlated with its amount of detail. For example, you can read more about a case study in which Intel, one of the world's largest and highest valued makers of semiconductor chips, solved their production plant downtime problem with a simple but effective model and achieved significant savings with little effort. To change the pace before moving on into more example models, it is useful to review the life cycle of a simulation model. After developing the model inside the AnyLogic development environment, you'll want to start using it. AnyLogic itself is a desktop application and model development is done on a local machine, like a laptop or workstation. To use the model, such as experimenting with it and running different experiments, you have several options. 
First option is to run the experiment from inside any logic. If you want others to run it, you'll need to share the model source files and the recipient will need to have any logic installed on their machine. With a licensed AnyLogic professional, models can be exported as a standalone Java applications free of charge and an unlimited number of times. This provides the modeler to share it to others who have the ability to run the AnyLogic standalone model without needing to have AnyLogic installed on their machine. Everything you need to run the model on its own will be bundled inside a folder that you can share with your colleagues or clients. The third option is to upload your models to AnyLogic Cloud. AnyLogic models hosted in AnyLogic Cloud run on a server. Because the execution is visualized in a web browser, end users do not require AnyLogic to be installed on their machine. Also worth mentioning is that the setting and uploading models to the AnyLogic Cloud does not require any extra effort. All the models that are developed in any logic desktop development environment can be uploaded with a few clicks from inside the software. In the web interface, you can also build experiments with customized dashboards. These dashboards let you have a comprehensive dynamic view of your outputs. You can compare the outputs of several runs. and you can also share your models with different level of access. To get access to the uploaded models, all you need is a browser. All the backend computations are happening on the servers. Therefore, you can run complex experiments via tablets or cell phones and see the results. Any logic cloud also can function as a public gallery of models, allowing modelers around the world to share their work. It's a great place for experimenting, learning, and collaborating between modelers. In a nutshell, any logic cloud is a reliable environment for executing your models. You can build experiments in the cloud, easily share models with others using different levels of access, enables user collaboration, and provide multi-user access to the model, and it leverages high-performance parallel execution for heavy multi-run experiments. Okay, from this point on, instead of running the models from inside any logic development environment, I'm going to review and run the models in any logic cloud. As you know, even before this pandemic, online shopping was on the rise, allowing sellers to focus on fulfillment of orders and the supply chain without the added cost from brick and mortar stores. However, the main challenge in warehousing is setting up a permanent layout and having an inefficient operation would be a nightmare. It's further complicated by the majority of businesses that have to work with pre-existing equipment and the spaces that need enhancement or expansion. AnyLogic includes the specialized material handling library that lets you simulate and analyze end-to-end -end processes of factory floors and storage facilities. In a nutshell, material handling library lets you simulate movement of goods with conveyors, transporters, lift, and cranes. Let's take a look at an example of a warehouse operation. In this example, pallets with food, drinks, and dishes arrive at docks for delivery onto the pallet conveyor system. These goods are then taken from the pallets by either robots or workers and placed on in-feeding conveyors that take them to racks. Cartons are delivered to order picking lines where operators put the ordered goods inside boxes. If there are other goods that need to be added to the order, the carton is conveyed to the next picking line. Otherwise, the carton is moved to the packing line and then to a sorting station. Similar to previous examples, you can add all types of metrics and KPIs to monitor the operation. 
For example, you can see a distribution of picking time and order processing time. To see more about the capabilities of any logic transporters, especially if you want to use the free movement capabilities of automated guided vehicles or forklifts, please review the model called Transporters Moving in Free Space. For free space AGVs, you can observe a density map of their movement to compare alternative layout designs. To see real examples of how companies like Walmart and Cardinal Health use simulation for their warehousing solutions to save millions of dollars, you can refer to these case studies at our website. Now it's time to look at a model that simulates the flows, inventory levels, and utilization of resources in a supply chain. Here, we are not focusing on any operations inside the four walls as we saw in the previous examples. Instead, we want to use the scalability of any logic to simulate the entire supply chain operation at a higher level. This model simulates product delivery in Europe. The supply chain includes three manufacturing facilities and 15 distributors that each order random amounts of product every one to two days. There is a fleet of trucks in each manufacturing facility that are used to deliver the product. When a manufacturing facility receives an order from a distributor, it checks the amount of products in storage. If the required amount is available, it sends a loaded truck to the distributor. Otherwise, the order waits until the factory produces the sufficient number of products. As you can see, this model uses the GIS functionality of any logic. Trucks move along real roads and are following the fastest routes that are retrieved from a route provider server. Another interesting aspect of this model is that it is self-configurable, which means that the model can adaptively configure itself based on the data from connected database tables. Because the model was created in this way, it allows us to easily change the model's configuration just by adding or removing a row in the tables. This level of flexibility allows for setting up specific simulation situations such as dynamically changing the capacity of manufacturing center, retailer, distribution center, or scheduling a complete shutdown to monitor the impacts of such changes or disruptions on the overall supply chain. Looking into the simulation output, we can see that the model produces useful information like a time plot of the inventory levels, utilization of trucks that belong to each manufacturing center, and a distribution of waiting times for product delivery. Looking into the experiments dashboard, we can see that there is a Monte Carlo experiment that let us run the same simulation model for several times and observe a plot that shows the mean and error level of inventory. Basically, we are looking at a range of possibilities instead of one. To see a large-scale application of simulation for supply chain management, you can refer to the case study titled Microsoft End-to-End -end Supply Chain Management Solution. In this project, a team of simulation consultants developed a self-configurable supply chain simulation model. They were able to validate the likely operational and financial improvements that would be achieved from the theory of constraint-based solution design before it went live. According to Microsoft's CTO of Global Supply Chain, the outcome has been nothing short of remarkable. In that time, we've seen our service levels rise to our customers by over 5%. At the same time, we've seen our inventory levels drop by quarter billion dollars across the board, which has led to reduced markdowns and reduced excess and obsolescence of over $100 million. Let's switch to a major problem currently at hand due to the surge in the number of COVID-19 patients at hospitals around the world. In general, the management of resources, which include proper resource allocation and scheduling, has always been a problem in hospitals. This is mainly due to the random nature of healthcare demand and criticality of the service. Adding a never-before-seen demand for scarce resources like ICU beds and ventilators to fragile and near-capacity systems like hospitals could result in catastrophic outcomes. 
Although a model cannot make changes in the physical limitations and shortages, it can be used to save lives by identifying the bottlenecks and shifting the planning to areas that will have the most impact. In this example, a trauma center that receives over 40,000 patient visits per year is modeled. The hospital facilities include a specialized express care unit and emergency department area. The express care area has its own staff adjacent to the emergency department. The model was developed to help analyze several improvement options such as adjusting staff levels and schedules, in addition to setting the hours of operation for the express care hours. Two scenarios are tested for alternative hours of operation and metrics for the length of stay at the express care unit and emergency department area are compared. To learn more about the real application of simulation in a hospital's operation, you can review the Indiana University Health Arnett Hospital case study. It describes how they improve their scheduling problems with simulation models and better manage the number of no-show patients. While on the related topic of healthcare, it may be interesting to take a look at an epidemic model. Almost all COVID-19 projections that you hear about in the news are based on simulation models. The majority of them are built by one of two types of simulation methods, system dynamics or agent-based modeling. Any logic supports both of these methods, which is why it's very popular among the epidemiology modelers. There are several example models that are very interesting and comprehensive. But the model here, named agent-based epidemic model, is an easy-to-understand agent-based model that simulates the number of infectious people over time. By adjusting the parameters of the model, you can observe the disease dynamics and the cycles of its spread in a population. The next topic that I want to briefly cover is the digital twin. We think that the term digital twin is abused a lot people tend to call any digital representation of a system a digital twin, including cases where there is no connection to the real-world counterpart. A digital twin is a simulated version of an existing operational object, in other words, one that exists in the real world. Periodically, we take a snapshot of the real object state and feed it to its simulated twin. In other words, we will synchronize the current state of digital twin with the real object. After doing this, we run a simulation with a meaningful virtual time horizon. This horizon could range from a few minutes to a few weeks, depending on the context of the real system. Based on the results of the simulated experiments, we can send some suggestions to the real object to take certain actions. These interactive loops can happen periodically, and the period could again be different based on the context. Therefore, there are certain requirements for these specific types of simulation, such as having well-developed data connectivity, being flexible with deep parameterization, and being optimized for high-performance simulation. AnyLogic is among the only few simulators that is able to cover all the aforementioned criteria. If you are interested in this topic, please download and read the white paper titled An Introduction to Digital Twin Development. You can also check out this case study that describes how Siemens built a digital twin of its global maintenance repair and overhaul operations in its aeroderivative gas turbine division. Okay, and for the last part of this webinar, let's briefly look at an overview of the intersection of simulation modeling and artificial intelligence. Number one, synthetic data generation. Simulation can provide an unlimited amount of relevant, clean, structured, and labeled machine learning training data. This can be used in supervised learning, analytics, and data mining applications, including data not yet experienced or recorded. 2. Neural Network Training Simulated environments of real-world scenarios can be used for training learning agents using deep reinforcement learning architectures. A neural network can work interactively with a simulation model, dynamically reading its state and taking action. 3. Testing AI models 
Simulation modeling provides a cheap, risk-free environment to test the effectiveness of AI by integrating it into the model. It also allows for comparing AI against other solutions. If you are interested to know more about the reinforcement learning application, please go to the Features tab of any logic, select Artificial Intelligence, and click on Start Now. We'll follow up with a long list of example models, white papers, webinars, and panel discussions. I want to show you a newer case study that is from a partner of AnyLogic, Element AI, which is one of the leading global AI companies. In their case study, titled Tackling Retail Out of Stock with AI, they focused on replicating the operations of a grocery store and the focus was put on product demand forecasting and employee task prioritization for shelf replenishment. They used a simulation model to generate five years worth of minute-by-minute -minute product demand data with significant variability, noise, and irregular events. This was used as input to some AI algorithms for time series forecasting. As a secondary objective, the simulation model was used as a testbed to compare the impact of various AI policies for task prioritization based on a set of metrics. In the end, with the help of the simulation model, they've concluded that prioritization of tasks based on potential forecasted revenue produced the most profit. This case study clearly shows how we can utilize simulation as a risk-free environment to find better solutions. I hope you enjoyed this overview of simulation modeling and its application. The source code of all the models that I've shown are available inside AnyLogic's repository of example models. All you need to do is go to anylogic.com slash download download AnyLogic Pro and activate it as an evaluation version. You can then find all the models that I've shown and many more by going to the help menu, then clicking on example models. These models are categorized according to their application domain. If you want to see, run, and experiment with the models I've shown without installing the software, you can go to cloud.anylogic.com and find them under the relevant category. You can also search for a specific model by its name. All the case studies and white papers that I've shown during the webinar are accessible from our website under the Resources tab. You can download several free books, past webinars, video tutorials, and video recordings of past AnyLogic conferences. In this webinar, we wanted to give you a high-level overview of AnyLogic's capabilities. I barely managed to cover even the tip of the iceberg of its possibilities though. For a demo that is more specific to your own use cases and covers more details of the software, please visit our website at AnyLogic.com and under the Company tab, click on the Contacts. Here, based on your geographical location, you can find the right contact that can follow up with you for a more detailed demo. And finally, we are going to have another webinar pretty soon. That webinar's topic is hybrid dynamic models in COVID-19 planning and beyond. With this talk, Professor Natalian Osgood will discuss how classes of hybrid models can aid in more insightful, transparent, and nimble modeling in the context of unfolding uncertainties, with the COVID-19 outbreak serving as a central exemplar. You will receive an email with registration links pretty soon. I personally look forward to learning from Dr. Osgood's unique expertise and insights. Thank you again for your time today. I really appreciate it. You receive a short survey right after the webinar and your feedback is immensely important. Be safe and have a great rest of your week.